And we're considering in a, a concerned series of messages here on Christ's miracles from a particular viewpoint. I've called it the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. That is to say they tell us something about Jesus, about his will, about his ways, about how he works, where he works, the kind of people he's disposed to work among. See, they all reveal these sort of things. The miracles of Jesus are also a demonstration that he, Jesus is, in fact, above all. Now, uh, people may theorize about this, whether he is, in fact, overall, or king of kings and lord of lords, or whether he has all power in heaven and earth, and that you can theorize about it, but these miracles actually confirm that he is, in fact, lord of all. Jesus himself said in John 3.31, or John the Baptist said of Jesus in 331, He that cometh from above is above all. Yeah. Amen. He is. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 121 says he's been exalted above all, far above all principality and power, mm -hmm. and might, and dominion, and everything that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So whatever you have to contend with in those categories, yeah. <laughs> you don't face anything that's not in those categories. Mm -hmm. And all Jesus had to say is, stop! Mm -hmm. And all the only people that do not willingly do what Jesus says are, are people in earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Angels, demons, Satan, <laughs> everybody else, they instantly obey. Mm -hmm. Winds obey him, waves obey him, fig trees obey him. Mm -hmm. See, why? Because they know who he is. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the grand missions of the church is let the people know who Jesus is. Yeah. Now that's some things we want to see, see in these uh, texts. These are a little different type of message that I normally am supposed to preach, but I had this burden to that we need a deeper familiarity with Jesus. Amen. Yeah. That isn't uh, connected with a, a particular theological train of thought. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there are, pretty sure, precise and particular theological trains of thought. But your theology must be shaped by your perception of Jesus. Amen. Not by a convenient card that has all your major beliefs on it. Mm -hmm. Like, who cares what your major beliefs are? We want you to believe what God has revealed of himself, which is in abundance. Amen. Now, this particular event we're going to talk about tonight is recorded in the three different Gospels. I'm going to read... Matthew's account of it, Matthew the 14th chapter. It's uh, several verses here, but I want you to see the details of this. Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into his ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's everybody went home. And the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, maybe three to six in the morning, the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer! It is I! Be not afraid! And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come! a storm going on. You know. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water. Yeah. It's the only person in history beside Jesus that walked on the water. Yeah. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship 
came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Quite an event. Yeah. Amen. I want to look at the background of this because God works in certain environments. There are certain things, uh, certain areas Jesus works in. It is possible for you to leave your whole life the wrong place. Well, you just aren't where Jesus is working. You just, uh, just sort of make your own path and follow your own preferences. But I want to show you here, there's a certain environment in which Jesus works. First, there come a time when Jesus, like, stop ministering to the multitudes. Now, some people don't know this about Jesus. Jesus did preach to the multitudes, but like this was not where he opened the good stuff up. Uh-huh. You search and see if this isn't the case. Mm -hmm. If not in every case, there are no exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I know this to be the truth. And you, you can examine it, see if it's not. There are no exceptions where Jesus ever did open anything of any significant depth to the multitudes. Mm -hmm. He always taught baby talk to them. He always introduced things to them. In fact, the scripture says he never did speak to them aside from a parable, and he never explained to them what the parable meant. Right. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> of course, not anyone came to him and asked him about the parable. He did explain, he did explain it to them. So here our text says he sent the multitudes away. Mark says in Mark 6, 45, straightway he constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other side before and to Bethsaida while he sent away the people. There's two kinds of people. There's people Jesus wants to keep on talking to uh -huh. and there's people he sends away. Uh -huh. And everybody among us is in one of those two groups. Right. Jesus wants to keep on talking, keep on working, Keep on showing, and some time to go home. Now, the ones he sent home, as you may remember, were the 5,000 plus women and children that he fed. And the way he sent them home was unique. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, everybody, go home. Right. Instead, he told them, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. They said, what's this man saying? Mm -hmm. Is he saying that the, he's going to give us his own flesh to eat? Just cannibalism? Jesus didn't say, no, 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 I didn't mean that. He said, I'd say it to you again. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have eternal life. If you don't eat my flesh and don't drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they said, that's it. Mm -hmm. And they left. That's how he sent them away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he gave them a truth that you really got to want to know Jesus to pursue that. Mm -hmm. Amen. So he sent them away. And he told his disciples to go to the other side. Get it. Remember, though, this Sea of Galilee we're talking about. It's approximately seven miles across, so it's not just a short jaunt. Send them to the other side, Mark is specific, to Bethsaida. And then the scripture says, Jesus went alone to pray. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Jesus prayed with his disciples. Mm -hmm. One time when he was praying, he was transfigured, right? Before his disciples, while he was praying. Mm -hmm. well, it's the Mount of Transfiguration. And sometimes he prayed with his disciples, but... There were other times he went and prayed alone. So he departs to pray, drawing close to the Father, tuning up his spirit. Mm -hmm. It's like whether you can receive it or not, the multitude sort of drained Jesus. You find this quite often after he'd been at the multitudes, he'd withdraw alone. Because virtue, you know, was always going out from him because he had compassion on the multitudes. And he would do it to strengthen himself. Now here's the circumstances of this, of this particular miracle. The scene changes. Jesus uh, was, had been praying. The scene changes now. And now we note the, the ship is in the middle of the sea. Mm -hmm. And waves and wind are all about it. Mm -hmm. Matthew says the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So it was, in other words, the wind was blowing against them so that it wasn't helping them make the trip across. It was hindering them in making the trip across. <laughs> contrary. You should be able to identify with this. Mm -hmm. That there's a, here's the way life is in Christ, where the wind blows against you. That's the way it is. In this world, it blows yeah. against you. <laughs> blows against you. So that you have to have grace and strength and help to get to the other side. Now the Amen. disciples are gonna, going to learn this. 
And the John adds a little more to it in John 6.18. The sea ro arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So all of a sudden this wind swoops down the Sea of Galilee and a tremendous wind raises and the waves start to toss about and uh, waxes on into the evening. And the scriptures, here's how, it, here's how Mark says it. Mark 6.47, when the even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. Just out of the interesting way he says this. Another time, you know, we read where the, he was in the ship when the storm, storm arose, in the hinder part of it, asleep. But this time he wasn't even in the ship. He's on the land, alone, and the ship, Matthew says, is tossed mm -hmm. with winds and waves, that's it, at the mercy of the elements. And there they are. It was dark. John 6:16 6, says, "When even was now come, his disciples went down to the sea, and, and, and as they rode, it says it was it was dark, mm -hmm. foreboding." Now, uh, Jesus sees them while he's been praying. He sees them. It's nighttime, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're in the middle of the sea, and he sees them. Uh -huh. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they could see him, but he could see uh -huh. them. Uh -huh. You should derive a lot of comfort here uh -huh. in this. There are times when, quite candidly, you can't see him. His presence isn't vivid to you, but your presence is vivid to him. He still, he still sees you. Uh -huh. Here's what it. Uh, here's what the scripture says: Mark six forty eight, and he saw them toiling and rowing. Yeah. Rowing, you know, it was not a motorboat or a sailboat. He saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And then John adds a little further point for us. John 6, 19, he says, They had rowed 25 to 30 furlongs. That is, three to three and a half miles. Yes. Now, I would think that that's a sizable distance to row. In a, not to say anything about rowing in a storm where the winds are contrary to you and the waves are dashing up against the boat. But see, Jesus had told them, go to the other side. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, now what I'll do now, I'll prepare, I'll make a peace, I'll make it peaceful for you today. Sometimes storms come down on Galilee, but this time I'll just make it smooth, just smooth, just go straight. Up. That's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. You may expect this, that Jesus doesn't always work in a nice, peaceful, quiet, tranquil environment. Uh -huh. Sometimes you've got to be working out your salvation with fear and trembling and things are against you and things are, are battering up against the hull of your vessel, so to speak. And Well, this is the kind of time Jesus works in. Amen. This kind of time. Now, here's the details of it. Those are the circumstances he's working in. It's a help, another one of those helpless situations. <laughs> Anything the disciples could do about this. Scripture says about the fourth watch. I remember they started was evening, so they've been out there maybe eight to ten hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about that? They had spent this whole day feeding these multitudes. This has been a lot of activity going on. Fed these five thousand beside women and children could have been as high as twenty-five thousand people. Gathered up the fragments, delivered this one of the longest dissertations in Scripture Jesus gave, John the sixth chapter. He gave this and the evening come on and they started at evening and now they've been rowing for about roughly maybe 10 hours. And uh, says Jesus about the fourth watch, he went to them. Let them toil and rowing for a long time. Before he went. As Jesus, <laughs> as Jesus' manner, sometimes he waits till Lazarus dies. Yes. To come to the house. Huh? Amen. Amen. That's how Jesus is. Amen. And he came to the walking on the sea. Remember, a great wind had come down now. Mm -hmm. I can almost envision the sea saying, here comes the master. John, Mark 6, 48 says, he comes to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Oh, uh, Mark adds that little bit there. Uh -huh. It's like walk right on. <laughs> Right on past him. This is Jesus' manner. 
They'll test you out to see how bad yes. you want them. Amen. Amen. See, when he uh, met those two on the road to Emmaus, when they're walking, they got to where they, they were going to turn off and go home, and they said, Jesus made us that we'd go further. They constrained him to come in. Well, that's going to happen here, too. Well, the disciples see this figure walking on the water. I knew they weren't from America right away. I know these were American Christians. Because they said, It's a spirit! No, oh, nobody I know would say something like that. That's right. The scholars have taken over the church and managed to deplete it of any awareness of supernatural working. Yeah, yeah. These men weren't like this. Mm -hmm. They had a better hold on reality. Yeah, yeah. He said, it's a spirit. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says they were troubled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of a sudden, the storm wasn't the thing they were concerned about the most. Now it's the spirit walking uh -huh. on the walking on the water, and they cried out for fear. Mark says, Mark 6, 49, when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, like in, like in fear. Mark adds a little something else. Mark 6, 50, they all saw him. How's that? <laughs> and were troubled. Well, what's Jesus going to do? Well, he talks with them I suppose, while he's walking, making his always going to walk past him. He talks with them. He says, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. In his eye. Oh, in his eye. They didn't recognize him in the storm. He looked different in the storm and at night. Didn't look like it was really him. Couldn't make his shape out, his form. His mm -hmm. eye. Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. Matthew said, uh, Straightway or immediately, Jesus spake before the words left their mouth <laughs> and fell to the ground. He said, Be of good cheer. Mark says, Immediately he talked with them. Remember now, it's a storm. The winds are frothing up the waves, very dangerous, contrary to him. They're rowing hard, and now he starts a conversation with them. He talks. You sense he's not agitated by this situation? This is like one of us talking in the tornadoes. Hey, did you notice that house that just flew by there? He's not agitated by the circumstance at all. He talked to them. Amen. John says, He saith unto them, It's I, be not afraid. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not all that happened. However, Peter's in the boat. Mm -hmm. He's the only person that asked this. Yeah. I've heard a lot of bad mouthing of Peter. Boy, uh, it's going to be embarrassing when Peter, they face Peter. Boy, right. This is going to be an embarrassing situation. Someone that Jesus spoke so highly of and put him at the helm of the twelve apostles. <laughs> so he spoke up. Peter did. He said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. He said, Come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. That's quite a quite a vivid picture there. And the other gospel writers don't give this a particular account here. And you would think Peter might say, if you're the Lord, command the wind to stop. You know, that'd be the, what a lot of people would say. <laughs> if, you, if it's you, Lord, make the waves stop rolling. Help, help our rowing to be a little easier. Mm -hmm. Lord, if it's really you. you know, Peter doesn't say that. He wants to be with Jesus on the water. Amen. Amen. Hearing a storm. Well, how about you? Where would you rather be with Jesus? In the boat or on the sea? Peter, on the sea. Yeah. So Jesus didn't make a long to-do out of this. He just said, come. That's enough for Peter. He'd heard that words spoken before. He'd heard Jesus say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. 
Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. You'll find rest for your souls. He'd heard this word before. I think it resonated with familiarity. He'll call. That's him. Come. If any man's a thirst, let him come to me and drink. See? So he came. He got out of the boat. He had to, it said he came down out of the boat, which means it's, he's not in like a little rowboat or canoe type thing. There were, tw there were 12 men in there. <coughs> so he climbed out of the boat. What must have been some experience, huh? Uh-huh. Climbed out of the boat and finally got down on the water, standing on it, and he sets out to walk to Jesus. But along the way, he's, uh, he's diverted. His attention is diverted. Mm -hmm. And he saw the winds, and as soon as it happened, he began to sink. Mm -hmm. As soon as his eyes left Christ, he began to sink. Now, uh, Peter didn't know what to do. He didn't try and swim or tread water or make his way up to the top. He knew the futility of the situation. We're about three, four miles out in the middle of the sea now, so I, I, I'm going to have to have somebody lift me up out of here. Lord, save me. And he, Jesus immediately, immediately caught him by the hand. Now you think he'd say, oh, Peter, that was really good. Mm -hmm. Whew, boy, you walked on the water. You walked a little bit. I don't know how far it was. Apparently it wasn't very far, but... He didn't say, good job, Peter, boy. You made it a little bit. None of the others did, but at least you did. At least you tried. Mm -hmm. uh, just what he said? He said, oh, Peter, why did you have this little faith? Yeah. You think a little faith, you, th you really think a little faith will save a person, do you? Do you think a little faith will save a person? You'll be surprised how many people think it will. Well, if a little faith can't keep you on the top of the water, how in heaven's name is it going to take you to glory? Uh -huh. right. No little faith won't save you. Faith may start out like a mustard seed, but if it stays like a mustard seed, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Huh? So if you've got little faith, Jesus will let you know. He puts you in a circumstance. Now, see, before this event, mm -hmm. if Jesus would have said, Peter, what do you think? You think you got a little faith? He would, I don't question. He would have said, oh, no, no. We've left all to follow you, mm -hmm. which they had. Mm -hmm. We've left all to follow you. See, the circumstance brought out, his faith was little. It wasn't very significant. Mm -hmm. Then he, he adds a little more, defines it a little more. He says, why did you doubt? Mm -hmm. Why did you down? What? See, as soon as you saw the storm, you thought you couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. And of course, as soon as you think you can't, you can't. Amen. Hmm? This is the way the kingdom is, brother. Mm -hmm. If you think you can't, you can't. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. So as soon as doubts into your mind and you begin to question whether you can or not, whether you got strength enough or not, at that point, you start to sink. Yeah. And he lifted them up, and I've, <laughs> they went and got into the ship. I wondered if they said any more on the way to the ship. Mm -hmm. I imagine if they did, it wasn't a lot of, from Peter, unless it was, thank you, Lord, for saving me and lifting me up. Mm -hmm. And you notice the disciples didn't meet him and say, good job, Peter. Boy, that was really <laughs> something. You walked a, walk a little bit on there. What was it like? What was it like to walk on water, Peter? Oh, they weren't talking like this. Because once you sink, forget about talking about walking. When a person sinks, the testimony of walking's all over. No more. So they got back in the ship, and Scripture says immediately the ship was uh, on the other side. Mm -hmm. Matthew said, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Mark says the same thing, Mark 6, 51. When he went... Up unto them into the ship, the wind ceased. John says, then they willingly received him into the ship. Oh, when they first saw him, they were crying out for fear. They weren't saying, over here, over here. That isn't what they were saying. They were afraid. Don't come over here, you know. But now, welcome into the ship. John 6, 21 says, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. And they must have been at least at least two or three miles from the other side yet. Because yeah. uh, they just rode 25 or 30 furlongs, three, three and a half miles of a seven mile jaunt, but they'd been rowing all night. And the last half of the journey was instant. How's that? Yeah. 
Or have you noticed this, that when Jesus comes into your life with just a short period of time, you've got what you've been seeking? Amen. And the Amen. joy and the peace comes to you, and you're in a safe haven, taking the good things of God. It seems like I just turned around in an instant. Why? Well, because Jesus got into the ship. Amen. Well, there was a, a people, the response of the disciples is, intrigues me. Then when they were coming to the ship, they worshipped him. They that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Now you think they think, Of a truth, you have all power. That's not what they said. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. They didn't say, Of a truth, you can calm the sea. Huh? Of a truth, you can save a man when he's drowning. Mm -hmm. So of a truth, you are the Son of God. They went straight to the chase. Mm -hmm. There's only one person who could do something like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's God manifest in the flesh. That's mm -hmm. who it is. It's God among us, Emmanuel. That's who it is. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, they were amazed. Mm -hmm. I bet they just saw him feed 5,000 people. They just saw him doing this, yeah. do this. Mm -hmm. Well, then he was feeding the other people then. <laughs> I suppose the disciples got their share too. But, but this was a bit different here. Mm -hmm. Mark 6, 51 says, They were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. Yes. Let me tell you something. If Jesus, if Jesus can get you to think about him and think about what he does, there's some good stuff's going to happen. Amen. It's, a, it's quite a distressing to me to see how much religion does not leave people thinking about Jesus. Yes. A lot of it leaves people thinking about themselves, their problems, the resolution to their problems. Today, maybe tomorrow, left them thinking about Jesus. But now Mark adds something here that is very significant. Mark 6.52, he tells why they wondered and why they were so surprised. He tells why. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Remarkable. They received the bread of the fish from Jesus. They handed it out to the disciples. They went out and took up the fragments, 12 baskets, but they didn't think about what happened. Mm -hmm. hmm. Why not? I don't know why not. It was because, well, I do know. Their heart was hardened. Mm -hmm. And this is what it said. This is the Holy Spirit. Right, amen dictated this. So now you can conclude, but what if I don't ponder what Jesus does, or think about it, or uh, revel in it, or meditate on it? Why do I have, find it hard to do this? Is it that or maybe I'm not disciplined? I need, I need a book to have me, help me with a, like a short one-minute devotion every day. Or I need some routine, something to help me. Oh, see, this isn't it. It's a heart problem. Mm -hmm. It's a heart problem. When you can't have a sustained thought about Christ and the things of God, and which of us have not been here now, we've uh -huh. all been at this point uh -huh. where it was easy to forget mm -hmm. uh -huh. what Jesus did. That's because of hard hearts. Mm -hmm. That's why. It's because, see, sin in the world put a callus over your heart, and they, their hearts were hardened. Yeah. But at this point here, there was a breakthrough. Amen. There was a breakthrough. Now let's uh, look at a few observations about, about this event. What can we actually see here? Well, what Jesus commands must be done. If he says, go to the other side, that is what he meant. Mm -hmm. That's why they toiled in rowing. That's why. He said, go, now he said the same to you. Yep. He said, go to the other side. Mm -hmm. Make it safely to the grave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hold out till I come again. Yeah. Make sure you get to the other side. Mm -hmm. That's his mandate for us. So right. you live by faith. It isn't whether you make it tomorrow or not. It's whether you make it there or not. Yes. Though what Jesus commands must be done, if you take him seriously, he'll take your effort Amen. seriously. Yeah. Even though it looks on the surface like you're losing ground and failing, mm -hmm. he'll take due note of it. Now here's another thing to see that 
Sometimes you get trouble and inconvenience while you're obeying. Mm -hmm. Now there's some trouble comes that when you disobey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but these people were obeying. Yeah. And the trouble came when they were obeying. Here's the contrary wind blowing against them and they were put, extending themselves now to obey the Lord. Well, how do you react? <laughs> you can toil in rowing all night if necessary until almost the break of day. Keep on trying to get to the other side. Seems like you're row a furlong and come back a furlong. What do you do? Obedience is often attended with great difficulty. Think of Jesus. He learned obedience. He learned he learned obedience Amen. by the things he suffered. Well, we did too, actually. And here's another thing to see. All of our trials are observed by Jesus. He, he, he saw them. There they are out there, toiling and rowing. I think I'll wait two or three more hours. Got a little, little self-will remains in there yet. <laughs> they Looks like they still think they can make it. <laughs> huh? That's right. Look at, see, he's not in the vessel now. If he's in the vessel, that'd be a different matter. He's not in the vessel. Looks like they think they can get there without me. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll watch here a while. He does the same with our trials, brethren. Mm -hmm. But this is a merciful Christ That's right. that we're talking about here. Amen. This is one that loves his people. Amen. See, he's seeking our good and our welfare. Mm -hmm. If he lets you get to the end of your rope so you can get on to the beginning of his, that's yeah. why it is. We also learn here that sometimes we have to labor quite a while before there's intervention. Yeah. <laughs> now the disciples were, the, Jesus can respond instantly like he did when Peter was sinking. That was instant. There it was. It was an instant here. Sometimes you have to wait a little while. Jesus said this in Luke 18. That God will avenge his elect to cry out unto him night and day, though he bear long with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the way he is. And it's possible, <laughs> you, can, you can see this, that Jesus has no difficulty with the circumstances that, with which you, you struggle. Mm -hmm. The storm was no trouble with Jesus. He just walked on the water and walked through the storm. This is no difficulty to him Amen. at all. And so they figured this this is not a man, this is a spirit. Mm -hmm. they, they concluded this wasn't a but it was a man. It was a genuine man. He was he was of another order, but he was a man. And it is possible to go a little further than your peers. Peter went a little further than the other eleven on yes, this particular yes. night. He he offered to do something that no one else did. No one else said, We'll follow you. <laughs> now after they thought Jesus was dead and all was gone, Peter said, I'm going fishing. The others said, We'll go too. Uh, but they didn't say that on this. Uh, <laughs> they didn't say that on this occasion. Me too. They all climb out of the boat. Now, it's possible for some among us to to get the blessing quicker. And uh, even though they have some struggles after they get out of the boat, it's possible to go further. You got to believe this that everyone's not locked into the same yeah. to the same status. They really aren't. Amen. And while we're doing what's right, while we are while we are doing what's right. We can be distracted. Yeah. Now he was doing what was right. Mm -hmm. He was at the right place at the right time, walking on the water. See, so you became you're not distracted always because you get off into the bad territory. Sometimes you're on the right territory, mm -hmm. and you get distracted because whatever moves our eyes away from Jesus can be fatal. Yes. Amen. Even <laughs> if it's just looking at a storm, mm -hmm. can be fatal. I suppose that's happened to some of us here tonight. That you began to be unduly concerned about your circumstance. Like you almost get the picture Peter said, what am I doing out here? Uh oh, I mean, <laughs> I should have stayed in the boat. I didn't realize, see, I didn't realize how strong this storm was while I was looking on Jesus. See, as long as Jesus was filling my vision, I wasn't thinking about this storm. I was kind of unimpressed by the storm. I was more impressed by Jesus. But at the point, he became more impressed by the storm than Jesus. Jesus wouldn't let him stay on top of the water. Right, and he won't let you either, right. might add. Whatever moves your eyes away from Jesus is potentially fatal. 
And a divine uh, resource and help is sometimes attended with a rebuke. Reached down, take you by the hand. He caught him. He caught him. Remember Paul said, I, he says, I'm trying to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended. He was the NIV says, I'm seeking to lay hold on that for which Christ laid hold on me. Yeah. What does that mean, laid hold on me? It's like he did Peter here. When you were sinking, you laid hold. And as he's pulling them up, he says, little faith, little faith. See, some people don't know Jesus does this. Yeah. Sometimes they look at Jesus as like a doting father that compliments his little child, says, good, good job, good job, good job, good try, good try. Maybe you'll do better next time. See, well, Jesus has the capacity to do this, but that's not what he did here. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't expect him to always congratulate you because you made a little bit of progress. <laughs> Sometimes he'll say, that, is that all the progress you made? Uh -huh. After all the grace I poured out? Mm -hmm. After me, the Lord of glory and the Lord of the storm that fed the 5,000 in front of you and had you gather up the baskets, you mean you couldn't keep your eye on me after you'd seen what I've done? Mm -hmm. See, sometimes he tells you that. Yeah. He says, you've been in the faith for a long time. You ought to be a teacher. Amen. Mm -hmm. And you got to have somebody tell you the ABCs Amen. and tell you how you ought to trust Jesus and God is good and Jesus loves you. Well, that's mighty nice, but if you don't get a little bit further than that, you sink anyway. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Little faith. You don't want little faith. You want a robust yeah. faith. You want to be like Abraham who was strong in faith. Mm. Giving glory to God. See, it's, pos it's possible to be an old man. Amen and be impotent yeah. and to have a wife that's barren and can't bear children it's possible for that man to hear God say you're going to have an offspring and him to be strong in faith not consider his own body nor the deadness of Sarah's womb and be strong in faith giving glory to God see that's Amen. possible in Amen. fact this is what God expects from us yes. right. we are falling beneath our dignity and privileged to be less. So sometimes Jesus delivers you with a bit of a rebuke. Come now, must we not admit that a lot of our circumstances are due to our own foolishness? Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm? You might say, I've been doing the best I can. Jesus just come right out and tell you, no, you haven't. Mm -hmm. Don't say you've been doing the best you can when you start sinking. Mm -hmm. Maybe Peter's walk was right Good, he was putting one foot in front of another, the right place. Maybe he had to straddle certain waves. He learned how to walk around them. But his faith was little. So you may get the procedure down. You may know how to, how to mechanically go through walking to Jesus, but the faith is little. And what Jesus does, he confirms who he is. Now, they, they, weren't, they didn't say this, thou art the Son of God, a lot. Sometimes they would say, Peter, in a flash of insight, God revealed to him, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'd say, What manner of man is this? Yeah. This time they said, You're the Son of God. See, Amen. what Jesus does confirms who Amen. Jesus is. Amen. And until Jesus is inside the boat, <laughs> the storm continues to rage. Mm -hmm. You notice that Peter and Jesus, Jesus didn't accompany him on walking on the water. They got into the boat. What frightens at first can comfort at last. Yeah. The same person that scared them comforted them. Yeah. It's the same person. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have entertained, have entertained wrong views of Jesus. I can remember I have entertained in the days of my darkness wrong views of Jesus. I thought maybe Jesus would condemn me on a technicality. Say, aha! I told you to do five steps and you only did four. Mm -hmm. See, this isn't Jesus at all. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not looking for a reason to condemn you. He's looking for a reason to save you. That's yeah. what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. And all, Peter, all he had to have of Peter after he blundered was the Lord save me. And that, mm -hmm. that moved him to do so. And hard hearts can't associate divine power with circumstance. Now it says their hearts were hard, hardened. So they couldn't associate the man who fed the 5,000 with this storm. Mm -hmm. Couldn't make this association. Mm -hmm. 
After Pentecost, now they could. <laughs> Hey, after they had, after the Lord sent forth the Spirit upon them, Him being exalted, they never talked like this anymore. This was the end of this kind of business. So they, uh, you can associate divine power with circumstance mm -hmm. and make the connection. And one other thing, there's always a reason for unbelief and fear. In this case, here it was the eyes were taken off of Christ. In Peter's case. In the disciples' case, it's always a spirit. They couldn't make the connection between mm -hmm. the figure on the water and the one who fed the multitude. They, it was the same person. Yes. But they couldn't make the association. Well, perhaps you will be able to get more as you ponder this event yourself. But there's a lot of wonderful jewels mm -hmm. hidden in this event here that tell you what Jesus is like. Kind of tells you what men are like, too. Yeah. Yeah. And their weakness is the kind of the weak area, like the weak area is the ability to trust Christ and recognize Him instantly. This is kind of an infirmity of humanity, but it's something that can be strengthened and fortified. So you can see right away. You know, now, after the resurrection, when Jesus spoke to the disciples who were out in the water again, John said, "It's the Lord." Mm -hmm. He didn't say it's a spirit that time.